Frederick Fleet, the 15th of October 1887 to the 10th of January 1965, was a British sailor, crewman and a survivor of the sinking of the RMS Titanic. Fleet was on duty along with fellow lookout Reginald Lee when the ship struck the iceberg, it was Fleet who first sighted the iceberg, ringing the bridge to proclaim, iceberg, right ahead. Both Fleet and Lee survived the sinking. Fleet testified at the subsequent inquiries into the sinking that, if he and Lee had been issued with binoculars, we could have seen it, the iceberg, a bit sooner. When asked how much sooner, he responded, well, enough to get out of the way. In later life, Fleet suffered severe depression and committed suicide by hanging in January 1965. Fleet was born in Liverpool on the 15th of October 1887. He never knew his father, and his mother abandoned him and fled with a boyfriend to Springfield, Massachusetts, in the United States never to be seen or heard from again. Fleet was raised by a succession of foster families and distant relatives. In 1903 he went to sea as a deck boy, working his way up to able seamen. Before joining the crew of the RMS Titanic he had sailed for over four years as a lookout on the RMS Oceanic. As a seaman, Fleet earned five pounds per month plus an extra five shillings for lookout duty. It was as a lookout that Fleet joined the Titanic in April 1912, along with five other watchmen. Fleet boarded the Titanic in Southampton on the 10th of April 1912. The ship made two stops, first in Cherbourg, France, and then in Queenstown, Ireland. The lookouts, six in total, made two-hour shifts due to extreme cold in the crow's nest. The trip was uneventful until the night of the 14th of April 1912. At 22 o'clock, 10 p.m., that night, Fleet and his fellow lookout Reginald Lee replaced George Simmons and Archie Jewell at the nest. They were past the order given earlier by second officer Charles Lightoller to watch out for small ice. The night was calm and moonless, which made it difficult to spot the icebergs due to the lack of waves breaking against the base of the iceberg and reflection. Despite Fleet and his fellow lookouts having repeatedly requested to be provided with binoculars, they were not available for the lookouts. This is sometimes attributed to the last-minute change in the hierarchy of the ship when officer David Blair was removed from the maiden voyage crew, due to the knock-on effect of Henry Tingle Wilde being appointed chief officer, without mentioning where the binoculars had been located. It has been also mentioned that Blair accidentally took the keys of the cabinet containing the binoculars with him. Despite both inquiries into the disaster, nothing clarified why the lookouts were not provided with binoculars, although there are many possible explanations such as one that the White Star Line steamers lookouts did not particularly use them. Some experts have said that even using binoculars, neither Fleet nor Lee could have spotted the iceberg any sooner given the conditions of the night. At 11.39 pm, Fleet first spotted the iceberg and rang the nest's bell three times to warn the bridge of something ahead. Then, using the nest's telephone, he contacted the bridge. It was answered only a few seconds later by 6th officer James Paul Moody, who asked Fleet immediately, what did you see? He pronounced the infamous iceberg. Right ahead, warning to Moody. Moody acknowledged Fleet's warning and immediately notified 1st officer William McMuster Murdoch, in charge of the bridge. After the collision, Fleet and Lee remained on duty in the crow's nest for 20 more minutes. At 12 a.m., Fleet and Lee were relieved by Alfred Frank Evans and George Hogg. Fleet went down to the boat deck and helped to prepare lifeboat number 6. Minutes later, once the boat was prepared, 2nd Officer Lightola put Quartermaster Robert Hesians in charge of the lifeboat and ordered Fleet aboard as well. As they were lowered away, Hesians and American socialite Margaret Brown realized there were only two sailors, including Fleet, to man the boat, and called for another sailor to be sent. As no able seaman was near, Canadian Colonel Arthur Godfrey Puchin volunteered to join the boat saying he had experience in sailing. He was ordered by Lightola to reach the boat by climbing down a rope, which he did successfully. Once away from the sinking ship, the boat tried to reach the lights of a ship in the distance, thought to be the SS Californian. While Hesians remained at the tiller, Fleet and Puchin managed the oars. 
Arguments and problems arose on boat 6 as quartermaster Hessians kept insulting and mistreating the rowers, including Margaret Brown and Helen Churchill Candy. Later in the night, there was an argument about whether to return for survivors, with Hessians warning against returning saying they would be swamped by swimmers. The lifeboat finally reached the RMS Carpathia by 6 a.m. on Monday, the 15th of April 1912. After the disaster, Fleet underwent two inquiries, first, the US inquiry and then the British Rec Commissioner's inquiry. In the United States, he was questioned by Senator William Alden Smith, to whom he repeatedly said that had they been equipped with binoculars, the disaster would not have happened. Before the British inquiry, he underwent a long examination, often repetitive, for which he refused to answer many of the questions. Lord Mersey, chairman of the commission, concluded Fleet's interrogation by telling him that he was grateful for his willingness to answer questions despite his wariness when responding to every question. Fleet replied with a sarcastic thanks. Fleet served on the Titanic's sister ship RMS Olympic before leaving the White Star Line in August 1912 after noticing that the company treated those involved with the Titanic differently. For the next 24 years he sailed for different shipping companies, including the Union Castle Line. Fleet served on merchant ships throughout World War I. Later, he was the ship's lookout again on the Olympic during the 1920s and early 1930s. When he left the sea in 1936, he was hired by Harland and Wolf to work at the company's shipyards in Southampton. While working there, he lived with his wife's brother. He served again during World War II. Later, when he was about to retire, he became a newspaper seller, going through difficult economic times. Shortly after Christmas, on 28 December 1964, Fleet's wife died and her brother evicted him from the house. Consequently, Fleet fell into a downward spiral of depression. He returned to his brother-in-law's home and hanged himself in the house's garden on 10 January 1965. Fleet was buried in a pauper's grave at Hollybrook Cemetery, in Southampton. This grave remained unmarked until 1993, when a headstone bearing an engraving of the Titanic was erected through donations raised by the Titanic Historical Society. Thank you for listening, and if you would like to hear more biographies, please leave a comment below and perhaps give a thumbs up and subscribe to help my channel. Thank you again for listening.